Hello friends, my name is Luke the Gamer Duke. I enjoy playing, dissecting, and talking about video games. Over the past couple months, I've been spending some time in Last Epoch. A while ago, during launch, I released some first impressions, where I went over my, well, first impressions of several aspects of the game, and by far and large was looking forward to further play. I've dumped about a hundred more hours into the game since then, entering the release of 1.1, and boy oh boy, things have changed. I've gotten through Endgame with the Mage, and through most of it with the Sentinel, and I'm currently running through with an Acolyte, and my overall impressions of this game are all over the place. Some things I do still very much enjoy, and others have me ripping my teeth out in frustration. What are they? Let's go find out! Before we begin, I want to go over what I'll be reviewing, and it will mostly be everything surrounding gameplay which includes character skills and passives, enemy encounters, UI, gear and items, and several other overarching gameplay mechanics. I'll touch on the story and graphical fidelity a bit, but I thought it best to gather more thoughts and discuss those in a future video. I also want to quickly amend a few things from my first impressions that were a bit incorrect. Firstly, I stated there is no way to reset the gambler's inventory, to which you can obviously refresh. I also stated, and uniques can have affixes added to the ones they already have. Ones they already have. Though, as we can clearly see, you cannot forge unique, set, or legendary items. And for some reason, I was under the impression stun shrines affect the immediate area around the shrine, rather than carrying it with you like all the others. Okay, now that we've decided reading is hard, let's get on with it. And we'll start out with a further discussion of the character skills and passives, as they are some of the most endearing parts of the game. Obviously, I have not played every character, every mastery, or every specific build, but I've played through plenty enough to get a solid understanding of how it all functions. And for the most part, the overall character mechanics actually function just great. The characters so far are distinct in combat and are mostly enjoyable to use. All the different types and kinds of skills offer a wide variety of playstyle, widen even more so with the number of specialization nodes and different routes to go down. For my mage, I turned him into a sorcerer. My sentinel turned into a void knight and the Acolyte turned into a Necro. Whichever mastery you choose will open up additional skills via passive point assignments in your newly unlocked mastery tree. Once your mastery is chosen, you will also have access to the first half of the other two mastery trees. The spec tree for most skills will start off with different types of straightforward buffs for that skill, be it added damage, lower mana cost, faster casting or attack, quicker cooldown, larger AoE, increased summon pool, etc. Some can add elemental damage, while others can completely alter the way that skill functions. The number of nodes can be a bit overwhelming at first, but once you spend a few minutes on each path, you'll have an idea of how you want to customize your skill. Most skills you will not be able to max out as the point pool is capped at 20. However, you can equip items with plus to skills which can put you past 20. Sometimes these node routes cross each other's paths, allowing for different routes to the same nodes. Sometimes they do not. Regardless your route, there are tons of ways to fine-tune any skill to your liking. The ability to respec or despecialize, and freely, is a great mechanic to have. Respecking points in actuality is deleveling that skill by removing points, then releveling it to its current max level. Having a minimum point pool up to 10 for despecializing a skill is another wonderful mechanic. Skills level fast enough to amass the maximum points relatively quickly. I use both respec and despec fairly often. One thing to be a bit wary of when despecializing to another skill is noting how many skill buffs come from your gear. For example, if my mage was swapping from cold to lightning, but my gear is forged or otherwise catered for added cold damage, the output of my new lightning skill could be vastly underpowered relative to the previous cold skill, forcing you to either reforge or find new gear altogether, which does put a bit of a hamper on the realistic freedom of skill swaps. Passive points are permanent buffs or boosts to your character, and I honestly don't have many complaints here. There is a very large selection to choose from. Several are straight up added character stat points, such as plus life, mana, ward, damage, resistances, and so on. And many others offer the chance to cast or attack under certain circumstances. Some further nodes have prerequisites, others do not. Same with skill spec nodes, you definitely will not be able to fill out the entire tree, which continues the sense of urgency and customization to your choices. In most towns, you will find the Chronomancer, who can reset your entire passive tree, either by single points or all at once. There is a gold cost per point. The more points into a given node, the higher the cost. Respecting everything at level 72 would have cost me 26,000 gold. More on gold later. 
The option to dip into the first half of your other two mastery points offers even more flexibility and or area focus. This does produce a bit of node overload though, and some passives can be a bit wordy or specific, leading my eyes to gloss over a few times. But overall, the passive nodes are straightforward enough to understand whether it would assist your playstyle or not. So the mechanics are great, but how do they function in practice? Well, overall the skills feel great to use. I enjoyed using the mage's skills thoroughly, particularly Volcanic Orb, Meteor, Disintegrate, and Flame Ward was hilarious. Smashing enemies with the Sentinel's Erasing Strike and spiraling around with Warpath was always satisfying. Throwing enemies into Anomaly, then luring others into his return bubble, and watching everything go BOOM upon returning is awesome. With max passive investment you'll have a minimum of 16 skills unlocked, not including secondary masteries, which can all be made useful with proper specialization investment. All of these skill effects, and most all the in-game effects for that matter, look absolutely fantastic. I said in the first impressions, but it bears saying again, I love everything elemental. Not going deep into the visuals, but the effects execution is a massive reason why the skills feel so great to use. But, and it's a big one, there is a glaring issue. One I tried to overcome, but found it consistently restricting. And that is the size of the skill bar. By max level, you are allowed over 20 skills to unlock, but can only use five at a time. Five. I'll elaborate more on why when discussing enemy encounters, but limiting the skill and spec number to five is a detrimental hit to overall gameplay, and seemingly for no reason. They could have easily added another one or two specialization and skill bar slots, and it would make various encounters so much more robust and engaging. And don't try telling me, you'd be OP and it wouldn't be fun. Oh, we'll get to that shortly. But the limited skill bar is quite disappointing, since as I mentioned, all the skills feel great to use and can be quite lucrative in different situations. The skills are easily one of the best features of the game, and I'd seriously like the freedom to use more of them with a given build. Alright, let's get into the entire reason you even use your skills to begin with. Enemy encounters. In catching the Sentinel up to the mage, the overall gameplay starts out fairly strong. The first hour and a half or so prior to jumping to end times as a solid introduction to enemy mechanics and what type of challenges you ought to face. Some enemies can catch you off guard and be deadly if you're not paying attention. But as I ventured forth into the end times and beyond my mastery selection, I began to notice something that I was quite fearful of in my first impressions. The enemy encounters are incredibly easy. Well, what do I mean when I say easy? I mean I am essentially walking through most every area with little to no challenge, blasting apart everything I come across, with the mage and sentinel. By the time you choose your mastery at about two hours in, you already become a destroyer of worlds. As a matter of fact with the mage, I had forgotten I leveled like I don't even know how many times, but I had 13 passes available and a whole empty spec slot by level 37. But since I was demolishing everyone as is, I thought it'd be interesting to see how far I could get without any more point assignments. How far did I get? I. Got. Far. Into the Necropolis. Through the gates of Solarium. past the Temple of Harawat, and to the Temple of Lagan. Lagan himself was the biggest challenge thus far, primarily because he's a meat wagon with me only doing 1% damage per hit, and the fact he just throws so much shit at you. But I was able to get through him in one go. Mind you, I'm not bashing my head against the wall here. I'm not flying through, but it's not difficult. The Sentinel leveled as normal, but was still simply destroying everything with the Erasing Strike. I had to resort to a makeshift COD Zombies match to keep myself entertained. The only thing that was getting the Sentinel was mass elemental damage, which completely nukes your health. But when you do have max resistances, you're back to being Superman. For a while, anyway. Additional tangents on resistances upcoming in later sections. The Mage is still not assigning points, and I have 34 now. And in Majalka slums and the lower district, I thought I finally might have hit a wall. But as the Sentinel ran into the same challenges, it was likely just the area. These and Lagan's temple were pretty much the only areas where I felt enemies actually took some firepower to get through. 
as when I got to the rooftops, that difficulty spike somehow evaporated. And eventually, the unleveled mage got to whoever this Majasa boss is, and I finally did hit a wall. I gave it a few tries, but simply couldn't get through. So I then maxed out the mage, faced Majasa again, and completely destroyed her as I figured I would. And moving forward, oh, that's, that was the final campaign boss, huh? <laughs> well, well, that was honestly unexpected. Man. Granted, the mage got through prior to 1-1, but I seriously did not think I was going to make it through the rest of the campaign without allocating a single additional point. The Sentinel blasted through Majasa without a problem. By the way, multiple full life replenishments is not how to make a boss more difficult. It's super cheap, nullifies any sense of progress, and honestly just pissed me off. More on bosses coming up though. Overall, you will essentially walk through most of the campaign. There really wasn't a meaningful progression of difficulty. The only real spikes occurred in the Temple Deaths prior to Lagan and in the lower district and slums. Or avoiding specific elemental damage if you don't have the resistances. But afterward, the spike immediately levels out. I will say though, that enemy and monster design is actually pretty solid. There is a good amount of creativity and most character animations are solid as well. But there's a definite sense of weightlessness about them. None of them feel as big or as small as they appear. Not to mention it seemed like I was doing the same damage to basically everyone. Making the vast majority of engagements feel very much the same. It's just a mindless smash fest. And eventually becomes immersion breaking. Before I get into bosses in general, I have to introduce the first major gameplay addition to 1-1. Boss Wards. What the ever-living shit are these? These are horrible. When boss health drops to a certain amount, an invulnerability ward will fill its health. Minor map bosses get it twice at 66 and 33% health, but all other main bosses will get three at 75, 50, and 25% health, causing you to either attack at invulnerability or run around like a cuck waiting for its ward to fade on its own, which is generally the safer option. At best, you blast right through them anyway, and at worst, they completely disable combat in its tracks. This is shit. Adding boss wards is one of the cheapest, laziest ways to simulate a challenge. I am immediately annoyed every single time a ward appears. As for the bosses themselves, they can range from pretty interesting to tediously annoying to a complete joke. Unfortunately, there are simply way too many bosses with trivial difficulty leading to almost all of them being completely forgotten about once they're beaten. The only real difficulty comes from avoiding one-shots, either from the boss itself or the insane amount of shit they throw at you. And thanks to Ward meaninglessly extending battles, the chance of dying because of bullshit is now much greater. Lagan and Majasa's battle were such a chore, none of it was enjoyable. Majasa's 2x replenished life, on top of three wards per form, was so annoyingly frustrating. The exiled mages were probably some of the more engaging in-world bosses, for a while anyway, as they actually took some firepower to take down, and used an array of melee and elemental attacks against you. But they eventually got too easy. And the addition of wards did not fix the issue, it caused a whole new one. It eventually got to the point where I'd spend more time fighting or stalling with their ward instead of actually fighting them, with their loot becoming ever less exciting. And with their elemental attacks able to completely nuke your health out of nowhere, their encounters became more frustrating than engaging, and I started skipping them completely. Now to get into the second major addition to 1-1, Nemesis is... Nemesis I? Nemesis. Either way. They unfortunately turn out to be a complete waste. I do like the concept. Random world bosses which offer a total of 4 items upon defeat. You can choose to fight, which will drop the items upon victory. Empower, which you will fight without the items dropping, but the items will receive an upgrade for the next encounter, up to 3 encounters. Or you can banish, which cancels the battle and provides new items on the next encounter. The primary draw though are the uniques. If one is provided, or an egg appears, in which case you can select your own unique, it can either grant the unique legendary potential for combining with an exalted, 
or turns the unique into a legendary by adding a random affix. Sounds cool, right? Unfortunately, the execution falls a bit short. They start off decently challenging with bleed, cold, and lightning attacks, but after a while, I was simply smashing them apart. Secondly, their items by far and large suck. As in they are either something not for your character, or the items are flat out underleveled. And in my experience at least, empowering a unique to give it legendary potential would more often than not just make it legendary instead by adding a single affix that may or may not even be useful. And all the nemesis look, sound, and use basically the exact same style of attacks, over and over and over again. Same as the mages, their elemental attacks can eventually one-shot you out of nowhere, and become simply unengaging. There is some positive in all this though, as I will grant a fairly good sized caveat to the area dungeons which you need keys to enter, as going through these areas can actually be righteously challenging or engaging. And death means you fail the dungeon and have to start all over with a new key, adding to the tension of these areas. The areas and their bosses were some of the more inventive and entertaining in the entire game, and the rewards seem much more on par of the area and difficulty. The Temporal Sanctum, upon completion, offers the ability to combine an Exalted and Unique of the same type to create a Legendary. Unfortunately, I didn't have anything on hand to combine here. However, there are only three of these dungeons, which is painfully lacking in comparison to the endgame, which we'll get into. The Lightless Arbor provided the most difficulty at level 65 with a 68 character. I actually couldn't even get through the boss. I'll grant these areas are supposed to be more difficult areas, but I only die due to one-shot mechanics. Also, those heavy boss attacks come at you so fast you almost can't even respond in time. Which seems to be a running pattern when moving back to the game as a whole. Combat goes from blasting through areas at record speeds to getting one-shotted out of nowhere. The amount of damage that needs to be done to offset your crazy health regen gets to ridiculous stages. I didn't even know how I died a few times. If I were to sum up enemy engagements as a whole with one word, I would simply say unbalanced. There is not a sense of progressive danger. Enemies either damage you so insignificantly that your health regen covers the loss in a heartbeat, or receive so much damage in such a short amount of time you're barely able to react, if at all. And I'll wrap up enemy encounters by returning to the skill bar. Its limited selection is a major crux to combat in general. Cannon fodder, mobs, area bosses, and story bosses are generally best handled with different types of skills or playstyles. You'll likely need a defense skill for bosses, and if you're incorporating your movement skill, that's another slot covered, leaving three left. Your beast mode skills usually have a cooldown or require heavy mana usage, needing a base skill to cover, leaving one slot left. Some debuff skills don't affect bosses, leading to a potential wasted skill slot for fighting bosses. You can see how this limits playstyle horrendously. Sure, I can despec to something else, but the point is to already have whatever specialty skill available when it's needed. Not to mention you'd have to constantly relevel skills. I feel confined and shackled. The Void Knight in specific was maddeningly repetitive to use. I see no reason why there couldn't be another specialization slot or two. There's a ton of overall gameplay and user interface mechanics I want to run through. Some of it is very well done, but there are tons of nicks and annoyances that really drag me out of the overall gameplay experience. Firstly though, is the introduction of the final major 1-1 addition, Dodge Roll. And this is awesome. Adding dodge opens up movement during engagements dramatically. It adds such a robust layer to combat mechanics that I'm honestly shocked it wasn't there on release. The Sentinel specifically benefited greatly from it. Thinking back, some areas would have been much more difficult without it. It is pretty shit though that in order to swap it for the summon crab you need to waste a ring slot on it, but why would anyone want to get rid of it to begin with? Anyway, dodge is an awesome gameplay mechanic to add, but its addition does have me a little worried, as I see it as a total missed opportunity, and I'll return to why more towards the end. But in continuing with the good, the character UI is still solid. Movement overall is fluid and snappy. There are basically no misclicks that I can recall. I never got hung up on any geometry, and your skills and movement mechanics go exactly where you want them to. The in-game shrines are pretty cool as well, as they offer a wide variety of buffs. I do appreciate the full customization of key bindings, as well as the in-game index which covers every aspect of the game. It's a ridiculous amount to go through, but it is there should you be confused about what something is or how something functions. Two wonderfully executed features are the loot filter, where you can refine loot to an absurd degree, 
maybe a little too absurd. And the stash, where you can purchase additional tabs with gold, add categories, and completely customize your tabs. And forging is pretty well done. By no means am I a forging wizard, but I spent a solid amount of time fine-tuning and upgrading gear, sometimes literally on the fly. There were a number of times I swapped out some affixes for random ones, which helped much more. However, one thing that is quite annoying is whatever item placed for forging remains there when you close the menu, rather than returning to your inventory. There were a few times I was interrupted when forging and didn't realize my item was not equipped. There are also maybe some unintended consequences to forging, which I'll touch on in the next section. I talked a bit about level design in my previous videos, so I'll just reiterate it here, but the level design, and actually the design of most everything, is pretty well done. There is tons of attention paid to the detail from the backdrops to the asset design and even their placement to the enemies and gear. This though is to be separated from the execution of that design. And now for some of the not so great aspects of the gameplay. I don't have much of a problem with health potions, though their math for higher health recovery can sometimes fall pretty short, even more so with the limited amount of potions you can carry. But my god, where are the mana potions? Why are there no mana potions? It becomes increasingly irritating running around in the middle of combat waiting for your mana to recharge on its own. The mage's gear even shows him carrying mana potions, so where the hell are they? Going negative mana is a nice cushion I suppose, but you do have to regen that mana regardless. There should have been many more opportunities within the passives to compensate for this. Even with my mage, several passives were more catered to resistances over mana pool leading me to waste the skill slot on mana shield for regen, even with stacks of plus mana and regen on my gear. I also simply do not understand how resistances work. You can take resistances well into the hundreds, but it's still only capped at 75? Which sometimes still leaves you getting absolutely wrecked if not straight up one-shotted by that elemental damage. The resistances feel completely untested. Outside of respecting once in a blue moon, gold is near pointless. There is no repairing gear. There are no hirelings. You will never need to purchase from a vendor, and gambling becomes useless by endgame. You'll need some gold to purchase additional stash tabs, but it's a pittance compared to how much you'll actually pick up. Area chests around the world go from completely useless to don't even want to look through them. Speaking of areas, the area titles drive me crazy. They appear smack dab in your line of sight, and they look way too overdeveloped, like they just kept adding more and more design. You better hope there's not a bunch of enemies around when you enter a new area. Speaking of which, the number of environment fadeaways continued being visual obstacles during combat as well. And speaking speaking of getting in my way, the dropped item text is horrifically annoying. There's fucking text everywhere. I can't even see what I'm attacking. This absolutely yanks me from any kind of immersion. Yes, you can limit the item text of the loot filter, and I have, but that doesn't nullify the problem. There needs to be an option to hide all item text and keybind a toggle to show it. I absolutely despise this, and it just reminds me of cheap-ass mobile game tactics throwing artificial dopamine hits at you. Ooh, look at this! Ooh, look at this! At this! At this! At this! At this! And the text isn't even nice to look at. It feels like it came from a Microsoft Word document. It's also very interesting that an item dump from an enemy or chest will just be this item pile image with text everywhere, instead of actually dropping the object geometry. The red enemy highlighting continues to drive me out of gameplay immersion as well. Why can't there be an option to change this or turn it off? Picking up mass amounts of shards borderline gives me an aneurysm with its pickup text prompt. I can already see all the shards on the ground. Why do they need to show me everything I was just looking at? The number of unnecessary UI prompts are everywhere, and they do nothing but get in my way and remind me I'm playing a video game instead of exploring a world. And I didn't even have damage numbers turned on. The gear and items both nail it and fumble all over the place. By far and large, the item types in tandem with their affixes are a solid win. There are tons of affixes to cater to your playstyle, and found myself switching out a decent amount of gear throughout about the first half of the game. Eventually though, you become enveloped in a golden shower of rares, and the number of affixes to compare and contrast can bring on item fatigue. I do like the name of the item will represent the same type of affix. 
i.e. Silver Rings, will always have plus movement speed as their main affix. But good luck remembering them all because there's a shit ton. Outside of a few class specifics, there are no requirements for equipping gear. So everyone can wield almost everything so long as they meet the item level. There's several rarity types including Rare, Unique, Exalted, Set, and Legendary, which I think, simply put, is way too many. Returning to the unintended consequences of forging, forged rares and exalteds will generally outpace most all uniques in terms of affix value and overall usefulness. Not to mention several uniques are incredibly build specific, greatly limiting their use across characters, and can sometimes have a negative value to fix like cannot leech life or minus x health per second. Why? Who wants to equip an item where you're losing health per second? Unless a unique was tailored to my build, I almost never use them. Exalted items are basically boosted rares and are forgeable. I found some of the most powerful affixes on exalteds. Set items are cool and their combos can definitely dish out some potential. However, much of what I found post-campaign was terribly underleveled. Forging a unique and exalted to create a legendary is a cool concept, but in practice it seems quite limiting as the exalteds must have 4 unsealed affixes and the number of affixes added to the unique from the exalted is based on what the unique's potential is. And from my experience of Nemesis Eye, getting the 4 potential sounds like the greatest luck in the world. Granted the item design is mostly well done, but all the gear seems to have some kind of Gaussian blur over it, making it look kind of washed out. The itemization and loot in general simply isn't that exciting. I'll continue with gear when I discuss endgame later, but another aspect I thought I liked and now I find annoying are idols. I do like the different size concept, but there are way too many types and sizes. At a minimum, they should exclude the four slaughters. Also, why is the middle idol slot blocked? You already have to micromanage your idol assortment, and this adds even more unnecessary micromanagement in figuring out what to use and how to make it fit. Opening up the one slot will not break the character. The only reason I can think of is they wanted to add an additional puzzle aspect simply for the sake of puzzle. It's so unnecessary, and unless I found something character specific, I eventually avoided swapping out idols altogether. Overall, item affixes are mostly well done, but suffer greatly from an absurd amount of overabundance. I'll briefly touch on the story in NPCs, since it plays a heavy role in my general disassociation from the gameplay, but I am planning on making a video diving deep into it because I had no idea what the hell was going on. There is way too much happening with little to no context, meaningful explanation, or time to let events breathe. It's so convoluted, and several events are hilariously convenient if not straight up contrived via idiotic character decisions. They throw so many names, titles, places, and events at you within just a few hours, and gets even worse the further you go. You meet characters, do something for them, then they turn on you. Or they vanish from the story entirely. None of it makes any sense. The dialogue is mostly awful as well, which is made even worse with the fact they seem to give up on finishing the voice acting, even for essential story-driven NPCs. But they gave voice acting to the dungeon bystanders? Balthus and Gaspar were really the only characters I cared about because they were given the most personality. Granted Gaspar is a bit of a moron, but Balthus was at least a respectable character. And after you jump to the end times, you never see him again. Everything post-mastery was a convoluted mess. It's made even more so with the number of timelines. Why are there five? There are simply way too many timelines and areas, with many of these areas completely ignored in other timelines. You're jumping all over the place with no reason of how or why, and freely at that. There's no mechanism, cooldown, or consequence to time travel at all. I was left wondering what the point of the timelines even are, particularly the ancient era. By endgame completion, I have two waypoints discovered here. I know there are hidden areas, and I found one, but what is the point of all this? Am I missing something here? You likely could have told the exact same story without any timelines. The non-essential NPCs are beyond pointless as well. Usually, they'll just tell you that your quest objective, which is right in front of you, is indeed right in front of you. Something that actually pissed me off, and maybe this is a nitpick, but where the hell are the cinematics? How do they have absolute top-tier rendered cinematics for all the game trailers, 
but in the game itself, they resort to barely or poorly animated motion graphics to tell their story? With some of the most boring and uninteresting narration I've ever heard, were their trailers outsourced? I'm trying hard to be immersed in what's going on, but if this is how they're choosing to tell their story, it just adds to the disassociation. And lastly, one of the most irritating things by far are the character portraits. What the actual shit are these? Why do so many NPC portraits fail to even remotely resemble the 3D models? It is absolutely jarring. Even detail within the portraits varies wildly. The detail on Belthus, Gaspar, Forgotten Knight, Spriggan, and others is so much better than on the swap amounts. Speaking of the Forgotten Knight, apparently she grinded some areas and found some new armor for 1-1. It's so frustrating and immediately kills any sort of immersion. Now, do story and characters matter in a game based around combat? Well, let's ask Elden Ring, whose story and lore, though cool as they are, are completely in the background. The difference is, everything else in Elden Ring categorically pulls you into its world. From the combat mechanics, to the map and level design, to the visual fidelity and outstanding creature creativity. Even the small moments of NPC interaction provide good dialogue and great voice acting. Everything in Elden Ring is fully realized, and as such, the level of immersion is maxed out. By contrast, nothing in the world of Last Epoch feels fleshed out at all. Hell, large parts don't even feel thought out. I simply cannot take any of the story, NPCs, dialogue, or world events seriously. If the developers can't even be bothered to match up character portraits, or finish voice acting, or type out coherent and somewhat meaningful dialogue, like, I don't even know. It's like trying to pay attention to a Disney Star Wars show. The more you do, the more questions you have and more confused you get. Alright, now for arguably the game's primary draw. The entire reason you got through the story in the first place. The end game. And wow. If the campaign failed to hold my attention, the end game fails even harder. It is probably some of the most grindy gameplay mechanics I have ever done. There are 10 monoliths to go through. Each monolith has a primary boss to defeat, but before you get there, you have to run through numerous levels, called Echoes, completing trivial objectives in trivial areas to fill a I can fight the boss now meter, which increases on echo completion and also on how many enemies you kill. The problem is, again, in execution. It will take about two hours to get through each monolith, and man do you feel it. Enemies are just as easy to blast through here as in the campaign, if not even more so. All the objectives are the exact same throughout every monolith. Defeat these amount of enemies. Find and defeat this area boss. Hold off these waves of enemies. Destroy these spires. Rinse and repeat again and again and again and again and again and again and again. Rewards for beating an echo can include gold, glyphs or runes, experience, or an assortment of different rarity items. Unfortunately, you are absolutely flooded with useless rares throughout most all of Endgame. My eyes glossed over and began cracking with reading and comparing everything and deciding most all of it was crap. All the uniques were horrendously underleveled, and god forbid you come across idle rewards. Holy induced glaucoma, Batman. Granted I did find a few solid items, including an exalted staff and a set I liked, but the amount of hay you have to scuff through to find something solid, let alone something that matches your build, is just mind draining. My Sentinel never found a better two-hander than the one I started with. Some of the blessings you receive from beating a monolith were not helpful to my character at all. I do not care about scepter drops. The Nemesis Eye and mages continue to show their frustration as they go from light work to randomly one-shotting you. And as dying in an echo nullifies the rewards for that echo, it can be more of a gamble than anything else. I continued skipping mages, but kept battling the Nemesis and hoping of coming across something good for potential but they were almost always turned into legendary instead. The boss fights have potential to be engaging and challenging, up until their wards appear, basically kicking the entire endeavor right in the nuts. It's so disappointing because it makes some of the more entertaining ones like Argentus and the Fire Shaman feel boring and drawn out, and turns the more challenging ones like Lagan or Herat into flat-out lunacy. 
Then add in the one-shot mechanics, and monolith boss fights go from challenging or engaging to enragingly frustrating. My frustration peaked when apparently a patch did not install all the way. Several mechanics were not working, including spire locations leading to those echoes not completing. All the nemesis spawn did not spawn nemesis, and even the monolith boss did not appear. Twice. And peaked yet again, taking my Sentinel vs. Lagan. It's simply fucking ridiculous. I am capped on cold and lightning res and still getting one-shotted from his beam. Again and again and again. On top of avoiding all of his other one-shot mechanics like tidal waves and his claw slam. What the fuck is this? How can my Sentinel blast through all the echoes in that monolith and not even stand a chance versus its boss? Granted I didn't have Ward on the Sentinel, but Ward should not be a required mechanic to not get one-shotted. Particularly with cap resistances. I laughed at the insanity and just gave up on him. Which takes me back to the primary theme of enemy engagement. Unbalanced. When it becomes tough, it's nothing more than manufactured difficulty. Eventually though, my mage reached the end of the end and unlocked the Harbingers. Which is apparently just rerunning all the monoliths again at level 100? Alrighty, let's give this a few tries and oh my ankle reacher. The one shots. Oh my god, the one shots. Are just... <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, I simply cannot be bothered to run through this again. This is where I called it. None of this is fun. It's not engaging. It's not challenging or rewarding. Honestly, I'd rather go cut my neighbor's grass. For free. In addition to everything else, there is a handful of bugs, UI irritations, or otherwise oddities that continue to bother me. Sometimes defeated enemies will simply stand there. Several NPCs are apparently mouth breathers. For some reason, the end times town maps reset, while others do not. Some areas do not show the terrain on the minimap. There were a few times my health dropped to zero and I did not die. There were many times when I ran for cover behind a wall and enemy attacks went right through it. Inventory item misclicks are very annoying and occur very often if you happen to be a fast clicker. Minimap quest markers can be misplaced. Set items do not signify whether or not you have multiple pieces available to you in your stash or inventory. When comparing dropped or inventory rings to your equipped, you can only compare one of them. When you swap out a better version of the exact same item with plus to skills, it removes the added skill points anyway. The glow aura around unique items is a bit overkill. And do they really need to be highlighted on the minimap? And lastly, this is probably a me thing, but it bothers my brain to no end that items of the same type face different directions. Well, there we are. A dissection of current last epoch. I say current because I guess any or all of these mechanics mentioned could be subject to change at any time. There are some good concepts that are executed very well. However, those couple of great aspects are simply not enough to keep me engaged compared to everything else completely removing me from the experience. The best way to describe this game is it focuses on quantity over quality. There certainly is a lot of stuff, but much of it is not well executed. I was expecting a lot more substance out of this game, particularly when there's PoE 2 coming up. Modern Diablo franchise is dead, I won't even go there but I'm completely disassociated with everything around me. The NPCs and stories are supposed to provide context to why you are doing what you are doing. Don't let the opening theme music fool you. There is no adventure here. Enemy encounters are barely even encounters. I found myself simply going through the motions of gameplay. You either blow everything apart or don't stand a chance. It's laughable. The gear is mostly fine in practice, but in the end, there's really only a few specific affixes you're searching for leaving so much of it to essentially be worthless. The sheer amount of loot they throw at you, 
all the time just becomes exhausting. Some bosses can be entertaining, but the wards absolutely destroys the experience. The Exile Mages and Nemesis were cool for a while, but eventually their drops were completely useless. Not to mention the wards again kills the experience. I stopped caring about empowering since most all uniques never ended up better than my crafted items. The other two primary 1-1 features, enemy wards and dodge, have me very concerned about developer decision making moving forward. I don't know who thought boss wards was a good idea. They are simply a horrible mechanic. Now, dodge is a great addition, there's no way around that, but why was it not implemented on release? The game was in early access for, what, two years? Did no one think of it? How did no one think of it? It's great to have, but comes across as a thoughtless last second edition. And if it's not a last second edition, and if they had it locked and loaded, why wait until 1-1? I see it as complete wasted potential, as every character already has a movement specific skill. A great idea maybe would have been to have your movement skill as your dodge ability. So instead of dodge, the mage would teleport, the sentinel would charge, the primalist would leap attack, and so on, essentially opening up a whole nother skill slot. Or maybe just add more skill slots. And it worries me because adding game changing mechanics on the fly tells me the developers might not know, or maybe not be fully testing what they're doing or don't know how to balance their game correctly, or are so focused on the tree bark they've completely lost the forest. It seems to me like they started with the skill tree and the end game concepts, then worked their way backward, essentially forcing the world to fit around a couple game mechanics. With all the changing features, including treasure lizards and additional shrine buffs, with this latest update, it legitimately feels like the game is still in development. And when checking out the roadmap 11th hour has laid out for last epoch, I would say that actually, yes, the game essentially is still in development. So the Ancient Era story gets released with 1-2, which is why there's currently nothing there. And you get full potential skills at 1-4? What does that even mean? Do they have a bunch of content they're simply not releasing yet? There's even a 1.5 that got cut off from their image. I'm sorry, but some of these are absolutely core game features that are completely missing from the game. Also, none of these versions have release dates. From my current understanding, 1-2 is scheduled for sometime around the turn of the year into 2025. It's crazy I feel the need to say this, but if your product is not finished, maybe don't release it yet. After watching the trailers and putting over 100 hours into the game, I almost feel bait and switched. I purchased Last Epoch because it was supposed to be a completed full game experience on release. This does not seem to be the case. Couple in all the UI issues, the laughable NPC portraits, the overall absurdly easy or otherwise unbalanced gameplay, the fact there's no story and no reason to care about anything you're doing, not to mention a major issue I had in my first impressions video which I haven't even touched on yet. The inconsistent texture and 3D model fidelity. I have not been able to look past it. Every time I load up the character select, I am completely underwhelmed. The lighting, reflections, texture resolution, and model quality throughout the world goes from well done to college class 101. Which makes zero sense since all the in-game effects and most of the general design are astoundingly well done. It's almost like this game was created by two completely different studios with completely different pipelines. And at the end of the day, in addition to the story, I simply cannot take anything in this game seriously. And by seriously, I don't mean a sweaty Halo match or facing Melania. I mean I simply cannot care about nor do I feel engaged with anything I'm doing. The only real saving grace were the skills. They are by far and large the primary entertainment and really the only thing that kept me going. After this current Necro playthrough, I don't really feel an urge to try someone else. I do want to get into some of the meta of crafting a little and probably go through the dungeons a bit more. Otherwise, maybe I'll return in several months after the next cycle reset and attempt a druid primalist. Actually, sorry, one last tangent. Speaking of the primalist, for this summoner run through, I was deciding if I wanted an army or a zoo, and it was decided immediately when I noticed the druid can only use a total of two summons. Two. What? Out of the potential seven summon unlocks, he can summon two at a time. What the fuck? 
asking the player to go through the game essentially 15 different times to hit the full breadth of the different characters, not to mention hardcore play, is an order I simply don't want to fulfill. Now, is Last Epoch a bad game? Maybe not exactly. It's definitely an unfinished game. I'll plant a flag and stand by that statement. However, there are some fun concepts. And if you're looking for a mindless smash fest, it can be entertaining for a while. Whether that's worth 35 bucks is up to your discretion. But if you're looking for literally anything else out of this game, there is a lot to be desired. The replay value is essentially banked on using new skills, but that dopamine hit runs into diminishing returns rather quickly, given the convoluted story, lacking fidelity, ease of combat, and all the other UI and gameplay issues mentioned earlier. And for me, that overall replay value simply isn't there. But feel free to let me know your thoughts in the comments. Have you played Last Epoch? What did you think of it? Are you still playing? Or have you given up completely? Don't forget to smash that like button if you enjoyed this run through, and remember to subscribe for more fun ARPG and other gameplay analytics. Thanks for watching, and I will see you on the next one. Adios.